All right, welcome to this evening's program, The Male Gaze on Evita. Before we get started, uh, we've got a little housekeeping. As I just said, please keep your microphones on mute during the presentation. There will be time for questions at the end of the program. Tonight's discussion will give you a chance to engage more deeply with the story of the musical Evita, which will be presented by Hickory Community Theater June 10th through June 20th. This discussion is brought to you through a partnership of Hickory Community Theater and Hickory Public Library. Our presenter tonight is the head of the theater program at Catawba Valley Community College, the recipient of an innovation, innovative artist grant, a CVCC Excellence in Teaching Award winner, and a top 10 community college instructor in the state of North Carolina. Welcome, Kim Stinson. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with everybody. I had prepared a PowerPoint. Just one second to get that up. All right, so is everybody able to see that? Um, I don't know what it's gonna do if I try to do this as a slideshow. It will give me one second to see if this will work. Yes, okay, great. All right. Okay, so is everybody good? Can I just get feedback from somebody that everybody can see the PowerPoint? Yes, I can see okay. it. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so um, for Hickory Community Theater, um, I am talking tonight about the male gaze on Evita. Um, I hope that all of you have, had, have purchased your tickets to see the show. Um, if not, we'll have information on that on the last slide. Um, all right, so just a little bit about what we're gonna do in this um, hour. So I'm feeling kind of more like a discussion leader, especially when we get to the Q&A section. Um, I'd like to get some feedback from all of you and uh, kind of your thoughts on this and, and what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. Um, I do have two master's degrees in theater, one in directing and one in playwriting, but I am not an expert on Ava Perone or the musical Evita. So I just wanna make sure that's clear. That was definitely not a research topic for me um, when I was in grad school, um, but I'm enthralled by her um, and her story. And um, over the last few weeks, since uh, John Rambo asked me to do this, I have learned a lot about her. Um, so I'm excited to kind of share that with you. All right, so for you guys, um, if everybody could please use your preferred name and preferred pronouns, um, I think I may have a typo in there, sorry, um, on your Zoom name, um, in the upper right corner of yourself, of your picture, um, the three little dots, you can change your name there if you need to. I think some people had just had their first names when they came in and that's great. Mm -hmm. So whatever your preferred name and if you have uh, pronoun preferences, um, that would be great to have as well. Um, I'm not great at seeing um, chat messages or when people raise their hand virtually here in Zoom because I tend to talk um, and, and can't, it's hard to split my attention that way. Um, but there will be a Q&A at the end, so you'll get a chance to talk and ask questions um, or make comments. Um, and the topic tonight, as you know, is Ava Perone. Um, and so we're gonna get right to that on the next slide. All right. Um, and let me also say that um, I have never taken Spanish, so I'm not even gonna try to pronounce things um, properly because I just I won't be able to do it. Um, but Ava Perone, um, her full name is there on the screen for you. Uh, just in case you're not aware, she was born May 7th, 1919, and she passed away on July 26, 1952 from cervical cancer at the age of 33. Um, she was known as the First Lady of Argentina from 1946 to her death in 1952, and her work to help the poor, the common worker, and the cause of women's suffrage um, is something that she's really well known for, and we'll get into more of that in a minute. 
And also she's uh, well known for her rise from poverty, um, from being um, in a low income or low socioeconomic family, um, as we would say today. Um, her, her family was like her mother was like a second wife to her father. And so he had two families at the same time. Um, so that was kind of part of, you know, the way that she grew up, um, which I think um, influenced her a lot in the choices that she made in her life. So um, her accomplishments um, kind of dig further into that. Um, so the women's suffrage piece, this is one of the things that I'm, you know, really as a woman myself, I'm really fascinated with um, her work in this area. So she created the female Peronist party um, and one of these, one of the quotes I found that she had said was, I demanded more rights for women because I know what women have had to put up with. Um, so she worked really hard for women in Argentina to get the vote, um, and she was able to get that accomplished um, through their legislature. Um, and so I think that's one of the uh, most wonderful things that she did. Um, and I'm a little biased after doing all this research. I really kind of um, admire her in a lot of ways. So she also ran for vice president um, while her husband was president. Um, and unfortunately about that same time was when she was really sick with the cervical cancer. Um, and the military was not really happy with the idea of a woman being the vice president. Um, so she was sort of silenced by the military. Um, some, a lot of the research I did showed that she was, the, the military was trying to silence her. Um, and at the same time though, she was having her health um, issues with the cervical cancer. So kind of the two together, um, she gave a speech about how she was going to step down and not run for vice president. Um, so, but she was trying. So I think at that time, because um, obviously we've just gotten our first female vice president in the United States, right? So at the time, it was pretty significant that she was running for office at all and even thought that, you know, she could do that. Um, all right, so she set up the Ava Prone Foundation um, and it did several things, um, helped with healthcare. Uh, and another quote of hers, Perone and the government brought in an eight hour workday, sickness pay and fair wages. So uh, she really worked hard for the common everyday person because that was the background that she came from. Um, so she worked in healthcare um, and she worked in poverty. Uh, and another quote that I really um, like of hers is, when the rich think about the poor, they have poor ideas. Uh, and I think that speaks to um, a lot of the things that we're going through today in our society here, um, which we can dig into a little bit more later. All right, so we're gonna talk more specifically now that we've given you a little background um, on her. So we'll move on to the musical. So the musical, everybody probably has heard of Andrew Lloyd Webber. So he was the composer. He did the music um, for the musical and you know he's done many, many musicals you guys probably all heard of. Um, if you're not familiar with him, you can Google him later. Uh, but he was working with Tim Rice um, who did the book and lyrics. Um, although on the script that I have a copy of, it actually just says that um, he was the lyricist, um, but it, from the things I've read, it seems that he did all the right, all the words, all the, you know, which the book is like the stage directions and any spoken lines, um, and then the lyrics are for the songs. Okay. Um, so the production history of the show, um, and Andrew Lloyd Webber has on his website, um, you can go and, and check um, his show page for this specific show. The London premiere was in 1978, and then it had a, a stint in both Los Angeles and San Francisco, um, which is, I think, still today somewhat common, um, where it'll think musicals often will premiere in London, then they'll move to the West Coast here. Uh, before they premiere on Broadway. So they get like lots of opportunities to tweak the show and fix it before it moves on uh, to Broadway finally. Um, the sources of information for Rice and Weber, like the, um, you know, what their sources were for information about Ava um, are a little bit uncertain. 
Um, I've had a lot of trouble trying to dig into where they got a lot of their information. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that on another slide um, in a little bit more detail. Um, I feel like there were definitely some biases in, in play uh, when they wrote the musical. Um, part of it's the time period. I mean, they're writing it in the 70s. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of us who remember the 70s, it was pretty, um, you know, um, hot time, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure what other phrase to use for, you know, uh, women's rights and the feminist movement and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. So, you know, it's, it's this whole, this musical and all of the um, sort of gender relations in the musical, I think we're heavily influenced. Um, that's just my opinion from, from the research I've been doing and from reading the play. I think a lot of it's kind of influenced by what, a lot of the things that were going on in society in the seventies. Um, and also some of the sources that I'll talk about again when we get to uh, Rice and Weber's uh, sort of what, you know, the information they had. Um, I think that some of the sources that they had were a little bit biased as well. So we'll talk about that more in depth in a minute. Um, okay, so let's get to sort of the crux of this and that's what's called the male gaze. Um, so it's men looking at women um, and viewing women um, usually has a negative connotation to it. So um, reading the script for this, um, I, you know, I hadn't read the full script before um, taking on this project. Um, and I was, I, you know, when I picked it up and started reading through it, I had honestly a lot of emotional response uh, about this. There were, there were a lot of, um, really negative things being said about Eva, which sort of reflect on, not just on her, but women in general. So um, it really kind of, in a lot of ways, was emotional for me um, to dig into this and do some of this research. Um, so the narrator is a character named Che. Um, and in the current version, um, he's just named Che. Again, the, from the research I did in the original version, it was Che Guevara. Um, and because he's originally from Argentina, but then went to Cuba um, and was, um, you know, an activist there. Um, and that's kind of another story, but um, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more about him when we get to some of the, the sources of information. Um, but here are some of the things that Che says um, that I have here on the, um, I guess, I don't know if that's your right or left, <laughs> um, but the one that says the narrator Che Guevara. Um, here are some, some of the things that his character actually says in the play. As soon as the smoke from the funeral clears, we're all going to see and how she did nothing for years. So that first um, one actually is a lyric from one of the songs. Um, when I have hash marks, uh, slash marks, um, that's a new line. So it's a, a lyric in one of the songs rather than just dialogue. Um, so... <laughs> This was the first, um, I guess, line in this piece that I had sort of an emotional reaction to because I knew that she, when I'm reading this, I knew that she died at the age of 33. Um, and then from digging in a little bit more, I found out that she started having symptoms of her um, cancer, of cervical cancer at around age 30. So, you know, that's three years of suffering um, and having symptoms of illness and, um, so for this character to say that she, um, hadn't done anything in years when it, you know, she's only the age of 33, I mean, gosh, I'd like to be 33 again <laughs> and have a lot of life left. Um, right. So, you know, it just seems really young, um, to have high expectations for somebody. And she actually had done a lot, uh, for someone her age when she passed away. Um, the next quote is, uh, again, from a lyric from song. Instead of a government, we had a stage. Instead of ideas, a prima donna's rage. Instead of help, we were given a crowd. She didn't say much, but she said it loud. So again, this was a piece that uh, of 
writing that um, kind of struck me as um, casting her as, you know, this this image of the prima donna, having rage, um, being somebody who's like, you know, acting like a child and pitching fits, basically. Um, so, you know, that perspective of her kind of, I had a reaction to as well. Um, then the next one, do all your one night stands give you this much trouble? Um, che is talking to the character Magaldi when he says this, um, and in the play, and I don't wanna to give too much away about the plot, I'm trying to be careful about um, some of that uh, for those of you ha who haven't seen it and are gonna go see it. Um, so this is a character that supposedly um, brings Ava from a small town, from her hometown to a bigger city and kind of gets her into the theater. Um, but when, with the research that I did, there's no actual proof that this person is a real person, um, an actor, that they ever actually even met, um, or they may have met, but they didn't have any kind of relationship like they do in the production. Um, but, you know, again, I thought it was kind of interesting that there's this um, perception that, you know, um, a woman is causing trouble just because a man bedded her first. Um, and then she, because of that, you know, then there's all this you know, angst from a woman about whatever, right, in the relationship or not relationship. Um, and then the last one there under uh, the narrator, things have reached a pretty pass when someone pretty lower class can be respected and admired. Um, and that speaks a little bit more to what I'm gonna talk about next week um, with uh, socioeconomic issues um, around this play. Um, but it's interesting that um, this narrator character not only is demeaning her because of her gender, um, he's also demeaning her because of the circumstances in which she was born and grew up uh, over which she had no control. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of layers of things in this in this play of you know stuff going on, and um, it also shows up in other characters. So um, if you look at the other male character side although you guys may have read that on your own by now. Um, the first one, uh, Perone says, maybe you're my reward for my efforts here tonight. Um, so in the piece, that's when they first meet um, and they are obviously immediately attracted to one another. Um, but the fact that a woman is seen as a reward for, to a man, uh, you know, for him doing his job um, seems a little, you know, <laughs> again, gender biased. Um, the next one, Perone is a fool, breaking every taboo, installing a girl in the army HQ. And she's an actress, the last straw. Her only good parts are between her thighs. She should stare at the ceiling, not reach for the skies. Um, so again, I definitely had kind of an emotional reaction to that one. Um, and that was the army. So the um, the chorus is kind of broken up into different groups. And at this point, they're the army um, and having, um, uh, you know, this, this perspective that the wife of the president of the country um, is only good for betting the president um, is kind of the intent here um, from this song and this, the lines here. Um, the next one, uh, but Senora Perón, it's easy to, oh, sorry, it's an easy mistake to make. It's still called an, I'm still called an admiral yet I gave up the sea long ago. So that one I need to give you some context for because um, it doesn't really make sense just on its own. So that one is uh, when she's having, uh, singing with an admiral um, and she's just come back from her tour of Europe and she, she says that they had um, actually called her a whore um, on the trip. And so she's really offended by some of the treatment she'd had on the, on the European tour. Um, and so in response, he says this to her that, um, you know, well, I'm, I'm a retired admiral, but I'm still an admiral. So in other words, you used to be a whore, so you still are one um, is kind of the intent of that line. Um, 
And then this last one, she's eclipsing the strength of the government. She should return to below stairs. Um, and those are some officers in the military at that point um, in the script. So she's um, ruffled a lot of feathers. Um, she's ruffled a lot of male feathers, you know, throughout the whole piece. Um, and so that's kind of, um, you know, some of the things that I find a little upsetting, um, you know, as a woman in 2021 um, to see from the piece. Um, all right, we're gonna go to the next slide. All right, so continuing this though, let's talk a little bit now that we've seen some quotes um, from it, let's kind of like maybe put it a little more into context and, and dig in a little bit deeper to some of this stuff. So Rice and Weber's intent, I mean, what was their intent in the 1970s doing this piece, um, you know, about a woman? Um, again, I had trouble finding interviews um, with their intent. Um, I've tried to find some interviews, but I couldn't really find anything that spoke to why they presented her in the way that they did um, and had Che as the narrator um, speaking about her the way that he does. Um, so on Andrew w Lloyd Webber's website, again, um, that same one that I had the link for earlier, um, he says at the top of that page, or it says at the top of that page, I don't know if he wrote it or his marketing people did, but it says she seduced a nation. Um, so, you know, that sort of speaks to me about the perception of her um, as a person, just the word seduced um, to me has sort of a negative connotation. Um, and then if you go to evaperone.org, um, which is kind of an interesting website, they've got, it's definitely a website that um, is pro Eva. Um, they've got a lot of information about her. It's obvious that the people who um, created the website are definitely biased in her favor. Um, so you get sort of a, an opposite viewpoint from that website than you do from this piece um, from Rice and Weber. Um, so they, have some information on there about how uh, Rice visited Argentina, but he didn't actually interview people who knew her personally um, and when he was doing some research uh, for the, the piece. I was not able to qualify this by saying that I was not able to find corroborating evidence. So I didn't find a like second or third source that confirms the things that are on this avaperone.org website. So I can't say that it's completely accurate, um, but this is their, their take on it. Um, they say that Che Guevara never met Ava. Um, they did have some pretty convincing um, timeline of information about that, about when he was born um, and when he went to Cuba um, and at what time that his timeline kind of was intersecting hers and how they um, never actually met. Um, and another thing that's interesting about this piece is that Rice and Weber have um, done different versions of it uh, at, over the years. So they've made edits and changes to it. Um, and one of the things I did find about in the production history was that they had um, called him Che Guevara in the first one and that at some point they dropped the last name and just have it call him Che. Um, so I think they at some point maybe recognized that they never actually met and so they dropped uh, the last name and so he's just sort of more a general guy named Che. <laughs> um, also on the website, the Ava Prone website, um, they say that she likely never met Augustin Magaldi um, that I mentioned a few minutes ago, who was the one that she's that she supposedly had the affair with when she was young, and then he brought her um, to a larger city. Um, and let's see, okay. All right, so continuing the this idea of the male gaze. Um, so the whole musical. The entire production sort of casts her as a bad person. Um, again, I don't want to give away the storyline for those of you who are going to go see it. Um, so, but to me, that's sort of troubling um, because it's definitely from a male biased viewpoint. Um, and again, though, we have to keep it in context with the 1970s when it was written. 
Um, but it does perpetuate stereotypes about women, uh, specifically from low socioeconomic life experiences. So um, that I found kind of troubling um, as I was reading through this. Um, and as a playwright myself, I'm kind of wondering, um, is there a better story? Um, is there a better way to write a story about Eva Peron? Um, could the story be better served um, from a female perspective? Would female writers, I think female writers would probably write it in a different way. Um, so I think I would be, I'm probably not the person to write that, but I think that um, definitely, there's some, um, there would be some benefit to um, some women writers looking at, at her story and trying to pick it apart a little bit more. Um, I think that uh, telling her story kind of from the, from her point of view as opposed to a male narrator um, would be really interesting because, um, you know, as it is, we're seeing Che's point of view, whether it was Che Guevara or some, you know, just guy named Che, um, seeing her through his perspective, through his eyes, um, you know, it, it does a disservice to her um, and to women in general. So I think that um, looking at it from maybe even if it weren't specifically from her point of view, I think telling her story in a different way without that male gaze, without that male narrator, um, I think would be really beneficial and could be really an intriguing project. Um, so even if she's flawed, and I'm sure she was because she was human, right? So she, you know, um, she very well may have done some of the negative things that she's said to have done. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of talk about people kind of like disappearing if they disagreed with the Perones, but you know, did she have anything to do that with that? Or was it her husband or was it supporters or did it even happen? I'm not sure. Um, I didn't dig into that as much as I would have liked to. I sort of kind of ran out of time for that. Um, but I think even if she is a flawed character, or I think if, you know, if she was really a flawed human, I think that makes her more intriguing and more interesting. Um, but I think having that story told from a different perspective, from a female perspective would be um, a lot more interesting um, in a lot of ways. Um, it's definitely something that, you know, um, something up for discussion, I think, because of where we are, you know, in 2021 and all of the, the social issues that we've had come up, especially during the pandemic um, and even prior to that, especially with, um, you know, women's perspectives and that sort of thing. I think it, it's definitely worth conversations um, and having conversations. And even if people don't agree, we can always agree to disagree. But I think that um, looking at her story from a, a female perspective would serve her better. And I think it would serve women better in general. Um, and why this matters, why I think, you know, some of this. So I really think that in general, strong women are silenced um, still today, even in 2021. Um, and I feel like we have a commitment to each other. Um, we have a social contract with one another, um, especially in the United States. Um, where it's really important to see each individual human, no matter who they are, no matter what group they come from, I think it's really important um, that everybody has equal opportunity, equitable opportunities, I mean, it's the right term. <laughs> um, you know, and I think that uh, it's definitely, like I said a minute ago, it's definitely worth having conversations about um, taking a look at, at these kinds of um, pieces of work and sort of examining them and, uh, is important. Um, because that really kind of gets me to this question of what's the future of theater? Where is this going? Um, what do we want theater to reflect for us? Theater is a reflection of our society in so many ways. Um, it's, it's, theater artists taking a mirror and holding it up to society. Um, so what do we as audience members, um, those of us who are theater creators, what, what do we need 
from theater. Um, and I think particularly post pandemic or, I, you know, we're not really quite through it, but once we get completely post pandemic, hopefully um, not too much longer, the how does the influence of things like this, like Zoom um, have on the theater, streaming performances, um, streaming at the same time you have live audiences. There's so many things that are, that are happening now. Um, so taking all of those things into consideration, what do we want? What are things that are worth having discussions about? What are things that, you know, we want theater to reflect? What voices do we want theater to amplify um, at this point? So I think that's definitely something to, to sort of dig into and consider um, as we move forward as a society. Um, and I definitely want to make a case for a new canon of theatrical works. Um, so for anybody who maybe doesn't know the term canon, uh, when it, in this context, um, is basically just the sort of original or classical literature, what's considered like the, the old standards, the classics, right, um, within theater. So traditionally, and I hope I don't offend anybody who's on the call by saying this, but, um, you know, it's traditionally the old white guys, right? So we've got like Shakespeare, um, O'Neill, you know, even getting more contemporary in the 70s, contemporary of Weber and Rice, Sam Shepard. Um, I had to suffer through a whole semester of Sam Shepard in grad school. And that was not fun for me. <laughs> um, but even Weber and Rice, right? So we've got sort of the canon in theater, the traditional um, plays and uh, that are traditionally from white men, white male voices. Um, so one of the things that when I open up to q and I'd really like to hear from you guys, how you feel about this. Um, why do we need diverse voices in the theater? How do we get more diverse voices in the theater? Um, and for those of you who feel that we do need those diverse voices, how do we kind of get buy-in from the general public? Um, you know, how do we sort of sell it, market it? Um, what are the important things to think about um, as we move forward um, with theater? You know, how do we make this work for everybody? How do we make it engaging and interesting for anybody who wants to walk in the theater, no matter what their background is. Um, and also, um, you know, seeing classical canon sort of as an informed and educated viewer, I think makes it more interesting. I hope that um, even though, you know, I've been sort of negative a little bit about the piece, I hope you guys are still gonna go see it because I think Hickory Community Theater of all the places, that I can think of is going to treat this with respect um, and do a really good job with this production. Um, just the fact that they wanted me to do this piece and they wanted me to look at um, the male gaze. They wanted me to look at issues around colonialism for next week, um, I think is wonderful um, and is to be applauded. Um, that they're thinking that way, they're looking at these pieces that they're performing and trying to fit them into the context of today, um, of the society that we're in now, um, and think about how they fit, how they don't fit, what works, what doesn't work. Um, so I think that even if we see classical canon, if we go see Shakespeare, if we go see this production, if we go see you know something else that's from that canon, going as an informed and educated viewer is gonna make it more interesting and it's gonna spark more interesting conversation uh, when you go to the bar at intermission. <laughs> um, so I hope that we can have a little bit of a conversation this evening um, after I finish talking um, you know, about this and, and what you guys think, maybe you think I'm insane, which is fine, totally okay. <laughs> um, but I hope we can have some open and honest dialogue about, about this piece um, and the research that I've uncovered and, and that sort of thing and what you guys might think about, about this sort of thing. Um, so if you have any questions, I may or may not have answers. Um, you guys are gonna get an email after the end of this evening 
um, with a work cited um, at the end of an art of the article that I've written that's going to be in the program um, in the playbill for this. Um, so at this time, I'd be more than happy to invite questions, comments, thoughts, if anybody has them. Um, I have a thought, Kim. Sure. <clears throat> um, and I, sorry, I don't, hang on. I need to change my view because I can't see. Okay. Now, just one second. I don't Okay. Good. Okay. Sure. I don't know who was talking. I mean, uh, it's Christine Stinson call, talking hey, in the theater. How hey. are you? Good, good. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, <laughs> and and the thing that really struck me was, I mean, I've, I've known about this show for years. I've seen it. I love the music. I sing all the songs. Right. And yeah, I really had the impression of her, um, not so much that she was a bad woman, but she was just a typical politician. She, mm -hmm. you know, she did, right. she got her way. She, she was corrupt in the end and, and for years, but, but I did, what I didn't realize and I guess in some ways I didn't know that she died so young, but I didn't realize really what a short period of time it was and how young she was, my goodness, to have accomplished so much. It really puts a different light on it because, right. you know, because that's all you hear is, is, you know, about the corruption, but right. my goodness, she really did a lot at such a young age and who knows what she could have accomplished. You're taking them out. Right. Yeah, I think so too. I think she, um, she. I, I mean, I hope. Who knows? But you know, I don't know how much corruption there really was mm -hmm. with her and her husband, right? So, I mean, I just hope that she would have grown and changed and 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 gotten better as a person. You know, as we yes. hope, all hope to do. But yeah, who knows? But yeah, I was surprised too because I had before I started digging in and doing this research, I had the same impression that she was much older when she mm -hmm. passed away. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, there's something in chat. There's, um, there are so many things. Let's see. Oh. Mm -hmm. I have one from Christine. It says, I thought the slide said she was born in 1919 and died in 1952. It may have. I may have made a mistake on math or something or dates. And then I think I pulled that from, wait, hang on. That would have made her. Yeah. Yeah. That's 33, right? Yep. Yeah, that's 33. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 1919 to 52. Oh, wait. It's 33 years. 50, 52. 1919. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was, I've been looking at, uh, I've been looking at genealogy. Hang on. I'm, I'm not a math person. Yeah, so I could, yeah. you know, 1952 minus yeah, that's right. 1919. That's right. I'm, I'm not checking. A math. 33. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was yeah. going to say, I got it off biography.com. <laughs> yeah. We well, have a I was just, <laughs> the whole time that I was listening to this, uh, you know, to the lecture, mm -hmm. I just kept comparing this particular play with that uh, masterpiece theater that was just on about uh -huh. um, the print, the crown princess of Norway. And oh, I didn't even see that. Though, um, it's the same thing. It's, it's whether or not an attractive young female can be uh, can be an effective politician without also being confused of using sex. Right. You know, and, uh, and, and then I'll, the only research I did on uh, the Norwegian girl was uh, Wikipedia, but they do have uh, contemporary accounts where people who were close to Roosevelt very much thought that it was an active love affair. But it, but it's still, mm -hmm. it's always the story of a love affair. <laughs> you know, I, you know, would right. Hamilton even have been right. uh, 
as as a popular if he hadn't had that side story about you know being what was it Theodore Jabeur's uh, hus- uh, lover or rival. Right. I'm I'm sketchy on history. It's not. That's okay. I just watched. It, so. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hulda, do you want to talk about your comment that you put in the chat? Did she leave? Oh no, there she is. Do you? You don't have to. I can just read it. No, just chat. Okay. Um. So Hulda put in the chat. I have always just thought using Che as the narrator was more of a political thing, he being a Marxist and her a Peronist. Peron did become quite corrupt as the years went on. Yeah, um, I, you know, it's, there certainly could be, I mean, it could, the intent with Rev, Weber and Rice, I mean, unless I talked to them and just outright asked them, I don't, you know, again, I didn't find an interview about what their intent was, but yeah, that I think that's a good um, perspective on it, that it's more about the politics. Um, but some of the things that he says do strike me as definitely gender biased, um, but I definitely get that political connection. But those sure. were those were Perone's actions, right? Not hers, right? <clears throat> That's a, also a good point. Because um, she she's the she was the sponsor of the first bill in the Argentine uh, Senate to uh, push for women's suffrage. Right. It was not the bill that was finally adopted, but she started it and she started a foundation for children. And, you know, they, right. but, the, but Che says she did nothing for years. Right. And she was, <clears throat> she wasn't even. Oh, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> in some respects, those are the roles of the traditional American first lady. You know, she's right. only allowed to do what the let what the let what the male power structure will let the women do. Yeah, and if, and if they have too many good ideas, they take the job away from her entirely. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's my belief that Abigail Adams thought that women should be able to vote. And she spoke to her husband about it. She did. And, and, and that never happened. Or that, I mean, it did happen, but how many years, how many years later? later? Yeah. Eleanor yes. Roosevelt didn't think women should vote initially. Yeah. She mm -hmm. thought that was going to uh, take them away from their traditional roles and that the uh, and that the country wouldn't accept it anyway. And she stayed home the first time that she had the franchise in the state that she was living in at the time, because some states had let women vote before other states. I only know this because the library gave a program on it. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. I it didn't know awesome. that. That's great. And the art museum, you know, uh, I've been a lot smarter this year because of what I looked into when the pandemic was going on. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think we've all done some of that kind of thing. But, um, in the, but the in local the, community provided it. It was really cool. Nice. John, the, did you have a Well, in the, in the musical about the first uh -huh. third of the first yeah, act is a series of moments of her yeah. uh, sleeping her way to the top to- Yes. Well, out of-, yes. out of out of Buenos Aires, that uh, right. you know, oh, because yeah. because she had ambition, um, right. it was the only thing that uh, that she could, the only way that she had to uh, work it. And also, yeah. right. um, there's several references where, and this is a classic thing in uh, in theater, and why women weren't allowed on the stage for hundreds of years is that actress is synony synonymous with whore. Yeah. At yeah. least in the context yeah. of, I mean, there's, there's that line in the scene with the generals where they say, right. you, know, um, you know, she's an actress. Yeah. 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 There, there's a lot. I just pulled out a few examples, but there, the, whole, the whole script is rife with references that you could yeah. pull out. Yeah. It, Kim, is, still, it is still a, a, a show that will hopefully inspire people to learn more about the real woman. Right. About about absolutely. the whole woman and not just right. this one aspect of her life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. And Kim, you had said uh, something about 
or, or is the audience ready for this? I would hope that we are evolving at a time and maybe now is the time that we would be ready. Right. More ready than you can see we weren't ready back in the 70s. Right. And that wasn't that long ago. And we may not be quite ready yet, but somewhere it needs to be become a more balanced thing that men and women right. are both equally good for society. One isn't right. better than the other, but they're equal and, and yeah. they need to share share flaws and and things that they do well too. Right. Absolutely. They're humans, just humans. Well, I, I mean, I would like to think that people are ready, but I know some people who aren't. <laughs> Not naming names, but, you know, I mean, so I, but the more of us who are, we can bring everybody else along, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> In literature. I'm sorry. Oh, just a, hey. a little bit. I'm sorry. It's how beautiful. I was just changing the subject a little bit, how beautiful okay. the play is. And, uh, and you're left with the beauty of Yvonne. You know, I remember seeing it and, and she was gorgeous. I mean, not pretty, but she was a beautiful person. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I got out of the play. Or the movie. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to hear you, but. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but it's good to see you both. Hi, Norma. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, um, you're a little cutting in and out. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Maybe if you put it, type it in the chat. The, the okay. comparisons between uh, the Perones and then when you look at the Roosevelt's and then you look at uh, the Kennedys and then you look at uh, the Trumps, uh, all of the comparisons between the two Perones and all of the folks that we have had in this country, uh, there is a lot to be tracked down and looked at, is there not? Yeah, there's some interesting parallels there. Definitely. Oh, I think people maybe got kicked out. I'm letting a couple of people back in. What's going on with that? Okay. Um, Cool. Yeah, I, I, I think I caught most of what you were saying. Um, but yeah, I think those parallels with the different co political couples. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Cool. Any other thoughts? I have one. Uh, we okay. talk about in literature mm -hmm. that to, to start reading, particularly from a young age, books where the protagonist is different from you creates empathy yep. and i think the same thing would be theater where where the author the writer is different than you and giving you a different perspective would create more empathy yeah. and more understanding yeah absolutely um and one of the things um you know that that i try to do at cvcc is have scripts um I try to encourage, I mean, we do have academic freedom, but I try to encourage all of my adjuncts that teach theater appreciation and storytelling to incorporate at least one script from a diverse voice at some point during the semester. Um, and actually we have this really lovely textbook that we were using um, for several years that I've adored and then it went out of print. And so this academic year we had to change um, but it had, the one we were using that I loved, had um, an August Wilson play, um, it had um, an Asian American play, it had a Hispanic play, and it had an LGBTQIA plus play. So it had a lot of diverse voices in, in it, um, and I'm so upset that it went out of print. Um, you know, but I try to encourage that, um, but you know, I'm just a drop in a bucket. <laughs> um, so I, I, I love it when we see, um, you know, more diverse voices, but it does also get to be tricky for those who are producing theater um, because you have to be now more aware of 
and sensitive to the way that you cast shows and the actors that you put in specific roles. And if you have characters that are from a specific um, demographic, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, that sort of thing. You kind of have to cast an actor now that fits those roles, which hasn't always happened, um, especially like in TVs and movies and, you know, um, but even in the theater. So, and there's been some controversy about that over the last few years, even with some Broadway productions. Um, so it does have to be, you have to be sensitive to that kind of thing. Right, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, we need to have more diverse voices so that we can um, learn from and grow from that, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that about literature. That you're promoting that with the public library. <laughs> it's awesome. Any other thoughts? Questions, comments? Does everybody have your tickets? Sorry, go ahead, sorry. Something else that, uh, because I told you back in the age of the dinosaurs, I wrote a undergrad paper uh, yeah. focusing on her. And uh, the military was so incredibly threatened by her and they had so much power in Argentina. Yeah. Um, but they were so afraid of her. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think that's something that that Weber and Rice did pick up on really well and translate really well into this piece. I mean, all the negative stuff that's coming from the, the military officers, all the negative things they say about her. Mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, you really see that in there that they, they feel that way about her. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Monica, yeah. Yeah, this is just one person's opinion. It's mine. But you said the military was afraid of her. But I do feel as if maybe we've all been sort of conditioned or something that people do fear powerful women for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Even other women that support women. When some woman gets a little yes. powerful, the others sort of resent her or jealous or something. So yeah. it's sort of a... That's just an opinion. But it's, opinion you. it's an opinion I share, but, <laughs> you know. Well, it must, it must have been, they were, must have been afraid of her for her ability to sway the lower classes to rise up yes. against the, the political structure. It wasn't yeah. just they were afraid of her as an individual. Right. They were afraid of the power that she represented. Yeah. Yeah. I, or, yeah. or the potential power. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, a good absolutely. point. Yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah. point. That's a, yeah, yeah, absolutely. She was incredibly effective at mobilizing the the lower classes, the yeah. poor people, because she helped them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because there's more of them than there is of us, you know. <laughs> but, right. Right. I mean, that's still the case today, right? We I mean, look at the right. yeah. one percent versus the ninety-nine percent. Yeah. <laughs> or look at slavery. The, yeah. the slaves outnumber the slave owners, but mm -hmm. look how they were kept in their place. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fear and intimidation and mm -hmm. violence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that actually is a great segue for next week. <laughs> We're going to dig into some more of the, um, yes, I agree with the comment in the chat about the Hunger Games. Yep, also similar. Um, so next week, uh, we're going to do this again, <laughs> um, and we're talking about uh, more of the colonialism, um, socioeconomic stuff, so I won't harp on as much about the gender politics <laughs> as I did tonight. But um, yeah, so next week, if you guys are able to, please join us, um, tell your friends. Uh, and I also hope that everybody has gotten their tickets for the show. Yes. Um, I think, uh, let me just do, yes, I see the Franks. <laughs> and yes, okay. Um, let me just real 
quickly again share my screen. Nope, I'll have to go back through. Yeah, hang on. Well, go. Sorry, technology. Great. Pull this back. No, not that one. Oh, tools are Zoom tools are in the way. Hang on one second. There we go. That's the one we want. <laughs> so if you need information for tickets, um, it's June 10th through the 20th. So Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, those dates will be at 7.30 p.m. and Sunday matinees at 2.30. Um, and you'll probably see the Franks there <laughs> at some point. And um, all seats, $18 tickets hickorytheater.org and purchase online or call the phone number box office 828-328-2283. John and or Christine, do you guys want to say anything about tickets or practical stuff? They're actually going pretty quickly. So, Ooh. you know, for people, I mean, I think a lot of this group is, has either has or are volunteers, but uh, yeah, no, they're definitely going well. Awesome. And we're sitting at, at the other thing I just wanted to mention, if anyone doesn't know, is that we are seating at full capacity now. Oh, okay. Is that masks or masks optional or? Well, we're still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> oh, gotcha. okay. Well, my whole household is vaccinated, so. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Cool. We're looking forward to it and we appreciate it, Kim and Beth. We're thank doing you. it. Hope to see you next week. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you, everybody. Cool. Thank, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody being here and taking the time to listen to me. Thank um, you. Yes. Thank you, Kim. Thank, thank, you. thank you. And everybody, join us next week if you can, 6 30 okay. on Thursday. Sign up on the library's website. Okay. All right. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Kim. Thanks so much. Thanks.